Hello. Hello. You might have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, hi, how are you? Good, I'm well, how are you? Good, 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 nice, uh, nice to see you, nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you, same here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, today, uh, well, let's, let's people gather together and we'll talk about today's presentation on Navalny. It's gonna be more like a discussion. I'll do a, you know, short one hour presentation, maybe even smaller quickly and then um, we'll have uh, a good discussion on Navalny. Uh, how did you um, find our group and um, what you know what draws to this to the subject matter? What you know what do you like about this subject matter particularly? I've done a few meetups before with Hank Orenstein. Oh I see I see. And um, a friend of mine has been doing uh, your group. Who is I that? Bev. Bev. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bev. Of course. Hey, Bev. How are you? <laughs> she's right here. She's uh, she just joined in. Yeah. She's um, you know she's pretty active. Comes here all the time. I appreciate for you know joining. Today is an interesting subject. But mostly, you know, we have different variety of subjects. We started as an ancient history. Um, you know. We went from Mesopotamia, you know, the first cities of the world, Uruk, you know, Ur, um, and then we went, you know, uh, Akane Empire, um, you know, we touched on a little bit of Egypt, and now we're in Greece. Uh, we actually did Alexander the Great on Saturday, so we did the whole gamma, almost seven months of Greece, um, and uh, we have modern subjects, like we're doing Hanseatic League this weekend. Um, so somebody offered this, so why don't we do Navalny since it's a news, you know, and again, I'm not an expert by any means, you know, I'm originally from Uzbekistan, which was part of Soviet Union, but I left a long time ago in 94. So I have not kept up a lot of politics. So, you know, we'll, we'll do, you know, we'll, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. And, uh, we have a couple of people here that also part of, you know, my group uh that would help me out a little bit uh i mean you know uh i started this group but um everybody else participates so it's not an issue so the way this group goes basically is if you have a question you could just straight up just talk and then ask a question obviously you know we, we're trying to be um you know polite and cordial with each other so if you have a question go ahead and ask uh, sometimes you can use messenger to ask but it's discussion group it's not a uh, a lecture um of, by any means and uh if you have something to add please add if you have if you want to correct me correct me i i'm uh, i have a thick skin so <laughs> no issues um a hey, uh michael yeah I'm not, I'm, 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 yeah 
Um, so we'll give it uh, five, 10 minutes. I want to generally talk about um, also uh, our group and what we do. And, um, and we have a website as well. So we'll talk about that um, and how the website works. And then we're gonna jump into the Navalny presentation. So, and again, like I said, I'm by no means I'm an expert. It's just news. It was a hot topic and uh, people offered, you know, um, Jane was kind enough to, you know, let's present this in our group, see where the interest and seems appears to be 31, 32 people joining. So that's um, one of our records, which is good. I, I've been following him uh, for a number of years. Can I you, think that, yeah, from- help me, help me out a little bit today, so. <laughs> I don't know about that, but he just never ceases to fascinate me with his, his courage is astonishing. Yeah, him, him, uh, Berzovsky, um, and the other one escapes me are amazing uh, as far as um, the one. His was brother as well. His brother, I mean, and then the, the most the most amazing, courageous thing is for him to come back after poisoning. Unbelievable. And and be able to issue this statement um, on YouTube. Uh, this is just you know nothing short of uh, amazing. I mean, I mean, people should really, if there was an election right now, Donna, you'd probably, you'd probably take 30, 40, 40% 40, 40 of Russia votes, maybe, maybe less, but just because of, you know, people are afraid in Russia to, of a change, but he definitely could be a leader. Not could I be. was, his, his daughter is a student at Stanford. Yeah. He was talking mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, he was he was saying how his daughter, interestingly enough, uh, was aiming for a number of universities throughout the world. And uh, in Russia, you know, they're very particular. So they were saying, "Oh, how is she attending? You know, Stanford. You don't have really you don't have you know official income. I mean, he works as I guess the uh, because he's his background is a lawyer." And he works for his friend uh, who lives in Switzerland and he pays him 5 million rubles, which is not a lot. And he said, how are you able to afford Stanford? So, well, they're giving, if you, your income below a certain amount, they're giving you the uh, subsidies and um, grants. And, you know, they were able to get scholarships for her. And uh, obviously Russia is like, oh, you know, they, it's, you know, U.S. Treasury Department is involved. <laughs> you know, they're, they're trying to help his daughter become, you know, Stanford and She's obviously in opposition. She'll come back and stuff like that. So uh, it was interesting. I believe he, he himself uh, graduated from some, uh, I believe either from Oxford or from, from Harvard, so somewhere in uh, Western University. I don't remember exactly where. Yeah, Yale, but I, I think he's a fe fellow in Yale, but I, I'm not sure he necessarily graduated. Okay, maybe, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, and then, you know. Maggie, oh, you're muted. Maggie, we're expecting you know a little bit more people. Um, so before we start, so this group has a website. Um, uh, so the group the group website is called omnicarta.org, and I'll post it in the chat. And um, you know, how do you navigate through it? So uh, in here we have um, you know about our group and whatever you can read about it. But we have YouTube channel. Um, and then everything we do here is recorded and then we post it on YouTube channel and the videos are in the middle right here. You know, at certain point, you know, I'll organize the videos between different aspects, but let's say, for example, if we're looking at the tonic nights, right? I did a short clip of the two hour video. I want, you know, I want you to, you know, observe for a second. And then, you know, there's an actual video there, but let's say tonic nights. Uh, this is the order that was in um, Prussia, so to speak, um, and I'll play it right now. Thank <laughs> you. 
But there's a two hour video basically you can watch. So now I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna meet a couple more people. I'm gonna stop sharing this website. I'm gonna share my um, uh, uh, presentation. Sorry guys. And then you guys are gonna let me know if you see it. Not right now, I'm still navigating. All right, let me see, share. Uh, oh, here it is. All right, you guys see it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, all right, so let me see if there's anybody else. I'll give it a couple more seconds. We'll give it a literally one minute uh, before everybody else joins and then uh, we'll step up. Somebody just joined. All right, so uh, we'll start at about 15 participants. So what I wanted to start with is um, Greg is going to talk a little bit about who Navalny is, and then I will join, I will start, you know, obviously I will add to it uh, the uh, poison with Navichok. Um, so what we can do is we can watch uh, a pretty short video on poison Navichok after Greg talks about who Navalny is. Greg, without further ado, go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know that much, but uh, just basic information. So he was born in 1976. Uh, just to give you a perspective, he's obviously from another generation from Putin himself, who was born in uh, 1952. So it's like 24 years old, younger, it's a new generation. Uh, so he... Um, he was born in the uh, Moscow suburbs. I think it was like maybe uh, 50 miles away from Moscow uh, uh, in the place. Um, and and uh, yeah, it's, it's a small town. Uh, and eventually he has uh, two educations. Um, he... Uh, has um, uh, uh, he has a degree uh, in law from uh, I believe uh, I think it's from uh, Moscow uh, Moscow or from University of uh, uh, it's a Russian University of uh, Friends of the Nations. Well, I, I believe this is the uh, Lumumba University uh, uh, in Russia. That's um, uh, so that he graduated in 1997. And, uh, and then uh, he also have a second education, which is economy, economy. He has a degree in economy from uh, Financial Academy, uh, at the uh, government of, uh, Russian government uh, sponsored. And uh, so he married uh, uh, Julia, uh, his wife in the year 2000. And uh, then he always been politically active uh, he, he met, eventually he uh, now obviously he emerged as the as the number one uh, opposition leader in in, in Russia. Uh, there, there were 
so one of, one of the, um, I think, most important things that he's achieving, he uh, made a team of very talented people, and he, him being uh, talented himself, doing all kinds of investigations of various, uh, 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 le uh, various leaders and uh, 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 exposing, you know, of the level of corruption and uh, the thievery uh, uh, that, that's happening in Russia. And uh, as a result, he's been prosecuted in many different ways. Uh, he's been um, arrested. His brother was arrested in 2014 uh, and then stayed in prison for three and a half years. Actually, him and his brother were arrested on, on the uh, made up charges of uh, money embezzlement. Uh, uh, and they kept his brother as like kind of like a hostage in prison for three and a half years. Uh, he's constantly being harassed, but he uh, really uh, uh, it's a kind of um, he showed like an amazing courage uh, because uh, uh, I grew up in Russia during the Soviet time, and and I would say right now what's happening right now is no less uh, <laughs> oppressive than. Uh, it was during the Brezhnev times, uh, and yet uh, he uh, comes out despite any odds, despite any threats, and uh, uh, and continues with his work. He does a lot of investigative work. Uh, the, 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 his team uh, and his chief of staff, Leonid Volkov, is a very talented computer IT guy, uh, and uh, they use drones. Uh, the, uh, to see all kinds of palaces by various leaders. Uh, uh, he exposed, uh, uh, the, uh, very early, he exposed Sabianin, who was a mayor of Moscow, and uh, uh, Putin uh, uh, basically supported him. Uh, he exposed many, many people. I, I don't know if it, the, their names would mean much to you, but almost every uh, uh, brothers Rottenberg, the, the uh, friends, youth friends with Putin. Putin basically brought a lot of his uh, uh, friends from his uh, life uh, and made them uh, 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 oligarchs. Uh, and, and now this is the uh, elite that supports him, that uh, have uh, personal loyalty because he basically brought them up and made them uh, uh, billionaires. So uh, he is exposing, uh, obviously, the, very famously, he exposed uh, the, you know, ex-president and uh, the prime minister Medvedev. Um, uh, and, uh, and now, um, of course, you know that he exposed Putin himself, uh, that Zach probably going to talk in details about. Uh, I think uh, uh, what other things, there were attacks happened at him at some point. Uh, instigated by the government, probably ordered, like at some point, uh, someone um, uh, thrown uh, a green uh, stuff into his eyes. He lost 80% um, of his vision, one of his eyes. Um, he has been arrested, exposed to some chemicals. I'm talking about things of prior. Um, I, I don't want to go through all the details and, and uh, all of the um, uh, work that he's done. But uh, he uh, created, um, uh, well, and now he is, um, uh, he is leading the, the opposition party called Russia of the Future. Uh, and, um, and also he, he has a, his own like team of about 30 people and a lot of um, uh, volunteer workers all over the Russia who uh, support him to distribute and uh, produce um, his uh, investigative material um, in uh, 2014, uh, uh, he actually uh, were planning to uh, unite with an, uh, another very prominent, probably at that time, even more prominent uh, opposition leader, Boris Nemtsov. Right. And they were planning to create a coalition uh, and uh, join the forces to expose and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, the corruption. Uh, at, at, from the very top. And uh, as you know, a few months later, the fe in February of 2015, Boris himself was assassinated. 
uh, you know, very obvious to many people that it was by the order of uh, uh, Putin uh, right uh, in front of the Kremlin. Uh, since then, uh, uh, Navalny became a leader, like the number one. His ability to uh, really get so many people behind him despite this is so dangerous right now uh, uh, all these people they they know that there is no uh, for them there is no future they're going to be arrested they're going to have a like, huge problems and yet they still come out uh, he's very very dynamic uh, uh, leader uh, really fearless uh, I, like the level of courage uh, you know if you if you lived in Russia <laughs> you probably understand a little more what, what that takes. Um, I, I personally would compare him to uh, uh, Sakharov. Uh, you know, there was an academician, Sakharov, very famous during the Soviet times. Uh, but he's, he's doing so much more. So, um, and as you know, uh, just recently, um, uh, there were a lot of attempts, of a small attempt, He's, he's constantly harassed on all kinds of um, trumped up charges, being arrested. He's, he has a lot of um, um, cases against him. Uh, uh, you know, the government imposes uh, tremendous fines on him. Like I'm talking about like half a million dollar, dollars because of uh, all, all he's being incredible. And despite of everything, he, uh, despite of all the harassment, all the danger, uh, uh, to him, to his family, you know, he is still uh, unbreakable and this last act of courage returning uh, to Russia uh, after being poisoned and, and, and exposing Putin while in Russia to show that he, he is not afraid. Uh, it's really mind boggling. So, I mean, this is my short introduction. Uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't mean to give uh, exact, uh, you know, I could actually go, <laughs> you know, year by year and, say, no, and uh, uh, tell you the list. But I think that's enough. Yeah, we should, um, now we're gonna watch a short video on poisoning of Navalny and then we'll talk about it. I will present, I'll up to upload the presentation after. The Kremlin is responding to new details in the alleged poisoning of Putin critic Alexei Navalny. The Russian opposition leader's team says a water bottle found in the Siberian hotel room he was staying in last month had traces of a nerve agent on it. Today, a Kremlin spokesman is calling the suggestion that traces of Novichok were on the bottle, quote, absurd. He said he could not comment further because the bottle was never sent to Russia and only investigated in Germany. Navalny is in a Berlin hospital after getting sick on a flight last month. Earlier this week, he posted that he's finally able to breathe on his own. And rescues are underway after her. Okay. Well, just wanted to, um, you know, I'm going to stop new share. One second, stop sharing. Let me um, put my presentation on. One second. Wait, wait. One second. One second. Uh, let me just share. Uh, so, um, presented. One second. Okay. So, as F. Greg has state, stated, he's um, you know he's an opposition leader uh, currently with uh, um, opposing Putin. And what happened to him is he was um, on the one of the political rallies in city of Omsk in uh, Siberia, and he sat on the plane and um, you know he didn't feel any uh, different. He, he was in Tomsk. Tomsk, he sorry. Was, was in yeah. Tomsk, sorry. Omsk, Tomsk, sorry. Um, and then he didn't feel any different, and he just sat on the plane, um, drank a bottle of water. And all of a sudden, there's a video. You guys can check it out. Um, he started basically, you know, moaning and please help me. I'm dying. I feel like I'm dying. So you know, this is he was poisoned by Novichok, and you know, we all we, we all know, you know, from um, uh, Novichok is basically a chemical, you know, a chemical weapon that was developed by a Soviet Union, 
that, you know, according to the Geneva Convention is not supposed to be used um, or any chemicals weapon should be used uh, in, in that regard. So it was developed in 1780s and basically um, uh, he, he was poisoned with it and it works very slowly. Um, it was apparently used in his hotel uh, where he stayed, um, but when he sent the team over to check it out, uh, you know, they basically weren't able to um, find big traces of it. There was only a small trace found in Germany. Russia refused it, you know, refused the, ho the whole thing completely. So let me start with a presentation here. All right, go back up, sorry. The topics. All right. So what's happening is um, we're basically going through the video that he posted about an hour and uh, 52 minutes exposing Putin uh, from his Dresden days. Uh, as we know, Putin was the um, so-called uh, KGB spy for working for, um, you know, working in Dresden uh, in uh, Democratic Republic of Germany. And his you know, job, Navalny's job is exposed. How does the Putin with a hundred thousand dollar salary um, is you know become in possession of a billion dollar you know palace? In, and we'll talk about the palace. And uh, therefore, um, what's interesting is um, if you basically look at his, let me just put in a present mode. Um, he, while he was um, in the hospital, intensive care, his team and him, um, you know, came up with this uh, particular investigation. And what's interesting is, um, you know, he's, he starts with, you know, basically how did, you know, Putin start it. So what's interesting is Putin wasn't actually working for KGB directly. Um, he actually initially was an administration that represented KGB in city of Dresden. So, um, you know, he was just a simple officer, you know, nothing crazy, but it's always portrayed right now that Putin um, is basically, he was some kind of 007 from those days and he was conducting the most covered, you know, operations. No, he was just a simple ad administrator in uh, um, KGB that was completely bureaucratic um, and therefore, you know, it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't really, you know, uh, you know, moving the needle, so to speak. Uh, but he, he was known at those times uh, to basically to kill for the sake of a, you know, chest of gold. But how do we know that? I mean, from the beginning, this is probably laughable, but initially what's happening is Putin, um, you know, he was involved in, um, he would say like a, maybe you would say a corrupt operation to mostly tried to bring in VHS, VHS tapes, which is in the 80s in Russia was, um, you know, very scarce. And uh, therefore, um, you know, he was involved in this huge, you know, st state enterprise to bring the VHS tapes from the uh, Democratic Republic of Germany to Russia and resell them. And uh, so basically there wasn't anything crazy about him, but he, he was completely loyal to Grandpa Lenin um, you know, and Kamu's ideas. Um, and, you know, at those times he was just simple and nobody. Uh, and now uh, Navalny is questioning, well, if he was a nobody, you know, it was just a, a simple person, um, you know, uh, but, you know, it, it was in Dresden, that's when he tried to create the connection to different KGB and Stasi uh, operatives. Uh, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, you know, he, his major mojo, Putin mojo was, according to Navalny, you know, say one thing, but do another. Lie, hypocrisy are the most effective method of work. Uh, second, the corruption is basis of trust. Main friends are those who steal for many years and cheat with you. And most importantly, money is never enough. Okay, that was a Putin mojo. Okay, so let's just go back. Right. So I guess. Um, all right. So how did you know Putin now uh, comes back from Dresden as being a KGB operative? You know, there's really not a lot going on as far as um, you know transcript of his life. 
you know, it was used to be called in, you know, early nineties, you know, um, it, you know, was, was called Leningrad, you know, prior to that as well. Um, you know, so basically what's happening is Putin makes a lot of very interesting connections. And we'll talk about this people. There's a lot of classmates that he went to school with university. And then Greg will talk about Putin's, um, you know, biography, which university he went to, that sat at the same, we call it desk basically in 1970s. One of them is Yegorov. There is also Ildar Ragimov and Viktor Hraman. Uh, basically, they were you know, both wrestling in, in, in universities and stuff like that. So Yegorov uh, recommended Putin, that was his classmate, to work in the mayor's office in St. Petersburg, okay? In the Committee of External Relations. So basically, that's where the Putin started to work. I mean, he was just another you know, bureaucrat but what's interesting, Putin was eager to join one of the main Democrats of the time, the radical critic, critic of USSR, Anatoly Sobchak. That was his, that was the most interesting thing, right? Putin uh, now we think is most conservative, but initially he joined uh, the uh, San Petersburgian, um, you know, member who was Anatoly Sobchak. We know his, his daughter right now is very uh, popular. Uh, blogger, and uh, she's also in politics. She ran for presidency of Russia uh, as well. And uh, so what happened is at that time, he became a true man who dreamed all his life about material things and money finally ended up in his possession. So now he's working for Sobchak in the, you know, and, and you know, helping him out and stuff like that. So uh, what's happening is 1996 election when Yeltsin ran for this second uh, term, he was helping Sapchak to become president, um, you know, um, and you know, obviously that failed, and he was afraid that something would happen to him, right? You know, uh, but what's interesting is prior to joining uh, uh, Sapchak, uh, there was a lot of machinations that Putin, materially driven, according to Navalny, had made a lot of the um, strides. For example. Um, uh, the most publicized bribe uh, driven privileges were uh, Putin's ability to give permits to trade copper, cotton, and any raw materials ab aboard in exchange for food. So basically he was working you know, for the mayor of um, St. Petersburg and he had the privileges to give licenses to exchange cotton, copper, raw materials for the food. So therefore Russia was obviously you know, materially you know, rich in those things oil in exchange for the sugar, potatoes, forest in exchange for baby food. Putin personally gave licenses to trade, but as it turns out, they were given to firms that were set up only for one day and associated with friends. So Putin friends like Yegorov and uh, all other friends, Timchenko, were all, all participants of this one day firms that basically uh, were set up to exchange Russian materials for food, you know, and then the more money obviously went for uh, to be, you know, in corruption areas. Scheme was elementary. The raw materials went overseas and fake firms were receiving money for it and barter products did not come. So the food they were expecting, the, the medical supplies, that, that, never, that never came. Subsequently, Putin became, you know, after he became, you know, president, he helped, you know, a lot of the Switzerland firm that brokered that with his friend Timchenko, you know, um, for the international oil sale. And what's interesting is that time when Putin was a president, four or five Russian oil companies were trading through the Switzerland company that actually, um, you know, was responsible for not receiving the goods to Russia, but the materials went outside. According to the Department of Treasury, Putin has in, in investments in Gunvor and may have access to Gunvor funds. This is a Switzerland company that was the liaison between Russia exchanging oil to the um, internationally. So now, uh, after Putin, basically, and I'm, what I want to do is um, I want to go through a couple of Putin friends so you would know, uh, as I've mentioned, um, this is Yegorov and uh, um, Ildar Ragimov, Ildar Ragimov on the left, Igorov on, I mean, oh, Igorov in the middle, and then um, his other friend, uh, you know, Hraman is on the right, and you'll see how important they are in his whole schema 
basically. And what I want to do is now I'm going to let Greg talk about the Putin uh, biology. I'm sorry, the biology, biography. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not biology. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just add a few details. Uh, so he was born in uh, 1952 uh, he, uh, in Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg now. Uh, his parents uh, uh, lived through uh, uh, the siege during the World War II. Uh, uh, he apparently had early, you know, bro uh, brother and sister who died during the siege. Uh, his father served in the NKVD, which is the old name for the KGB battalion, probably uh, uh, the, the battalion involved in uh, making sure that there is no retreat. Uh, uh, and then eventually later on in 42, he joined the regular army. Uh, and uh, so he was growing uh, up as a, you know, uh, regular kid. Uh, uh, he went, uh, however, after the school, he went to the uh, Leningrad State University. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, one of the best schools, the definitely best school in, in, in uh, 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 Leningrad. And, and again, Leningrad, as you know, is nowadays called St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, he graduated with a law degree. Uh, after the graduation, uh, 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 by the way, uh, during uh, his studying, he became friendly with one of the professors there. Uh, and uh, that was a future mayor uh, of uh, Leningrad Sobchak, Anatoly Sobchak. Uh, he, uh, after the graduation, he decided to join KGB. Uh, and he went for training in 1975. He graduated and went to KGB school for training um, and then worked. I mean, like, uh, he's, a little, he's a little older than me, but uh, uh, we are from the same generation. I have to say that uh, I haven't known anyone personally uh, in, in my uh, university where I studied in Moscow, uh, uh, and, and, and not, not the Moscow State University, it was an institute uh, at that time, now it's a university. Um, I, I have not known anyone who would think about going to KGB. Everybody <laughs> was afraid and uh, kind of despised uh, people who do. Anyway, he, he, during his um, uh, college years, um, he became a member of the Communist Party, joined the KGB, uh, eventually, uh, uh, later on, he was uh, assigned to uh, uh, German Democratic Republic, where he, is, uh, he has been for five years. Uh, and then when he returned, uh, very soon, uh, there was an attempted coup to dispose of um, Gorbachev uh, in 90, uh, and eventually Soviet Union collapsed. And he, at the, that was the time where he's saying he resigned from KGB because he didn't want to continue. Um, and, uh, and then that's he, when his um, uh, political career uh, started that because he joined the, uh, he was friends with his former professor, uh, Anatoly Sobchak, who ran for um, mayor of the uh, Leningrad. And, uh, and he became part of his staff, uh, eventually, um, he was uh, uh, his chief of staff at some point. Um, when Sobchak, um, uh, in, in, in the uh, late 90s, uh, uh, lost, um, uh, did, uh, you know, lost the election and, and uh, were no longer mayor, he moved to Moscow and uh, through various recommendations joined the, uh, eventually the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Yeltsin's cabinet. Uh, in various uh, positions, also was a, a deputy chief of staff at some point, uh, and eventually was given a position of uh, uh, head of KGB. Uh, at that point, I think it was called FSB. Uh, so he, he, when he retired, it, it, he retired in, in the rank of uh, lieutenant uh, uh, colonel, uh, and now he was a chief of KGB. Uh, I think it was in 98, uh, he served there. Uh, and, and eventually, uh, I believe there was some deal was made because um, um, Yeltsin was under investigation. He was a heavy drinker. His uh, 
uh, health was collapsing and he was really looking for someone who would cover up for him and, and uh, uh, protect him from the uh, future prosecutions. Um, uh, so uh, at the end of the uh, 1999, actually at the December 31st, uh, uh, he became uh, acting uh, president uh, until May when uh, there were forced elections. And uh, he, clearly he was elected because uh, there was in, in Russia, you know, if he was appointed <laughs> the, and uh, the, pow the, um, uh, the, guy, the power is saying that that's the guy you should vote for, that's what Russians usually did. Uh, uh, so, and from there on, uh, he started, uh, he, he actually within a few years, he negotiated peace in, in Chechnya uh, he made a very similar um, uh, kind of action. Uh, if you remember, uh, during the uh, Iraq war, uh, there was a surge, uh, you know, and everybody, and then things started to get better in Iraq. But the, the real reason was, is because that they paid the opposition Sunnis. So he did very similar. So he found the son of a very popular leader, Kadyrov, uh, and uh, he basically bought him. Uh, and uh, he became working for a government for Russia. And with his help, uh, he kind of um, uh, stabilized the situation in Chechnya and uh, uh, gave him a lot of uh, power, a lot of freedom to act um, to Kadyrov. And he basically subjugated uh, Chechnya and, and uh, as a, uh, I would say, a vassal of Putin. Uh, uh, and uh, so, but that was uh, because that situation kind of stabilized that people uh, were happy. Um, uh, also the um, uh, standard of living uh, rose uh, uh, pretty significant in the first uh, eight years. Uh, a lot of people ascribed this to, because in nineties it was a chaos. A lot of people is, uh, gave, gave him a lot of credit for it. However, I just want to remind you that the price of oil uh, and uh, about the, uh, 50 to 60 percent um, uh, of Russian economy uh, basically is uh, the oil and gas. Uh, so the price of oil uh, in the early 20s was uh, $26. And, uh, and then when the uh, uh, United States invaded Iraq in 2003, uh, right after that, it started to rise. And in around 2007, 2008, it reached $150. Uh, then it fell a little bit, and then it stabilized in later years around hundred thousand, uh, hundred dollars a barrel, and uh, only recently, uh, uh, you know, as you know, last year uh, when this uh, it started to fall. Well, actually, the recent couple of years it started to fall, and then it uh, went down last year significantly. So a, a lot of the wealth that trickled a, a little bit. Uh, uh, I believe uh, was a result of that oil uh, price rise because it rose five times um, and, and stayed very high for that period of time. Uh, however, uh, people attributed a lot of things to him. As you know, he did uh, 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 in 2008, he kind of, it was a very obvious game when he couldn't, um, didn't want to go, uh, didn't want to change the, he didn't feel, I think, uh, um, uh, very stable uh, to just um, uh, change the constitution. So uh, instead, he just uh, became prime minister and uh, Medvedev became a president for four years. Um, uh, and uh, the first act was to extend the presidential uh, period from four years to six to give Putin who would come later. And it was very obvious to everyone in Russia, at least, uh, that that's what's going to happen. Uh, nobody had any illusions, I believe. Uh, and uh, well, maybe some people did. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, well, al also famously in 2004, I believe he imprisoned Khodorkovsky, who presented some challenge. You know, that, that was uh, very uh, famously. As you know, he came back to power in 2012. Uh, and, and that's where when uh, basically um, Navalny is started to really um, become very famous and influential. He helped to organize the, the opposition uh, on the Balotna Square, you know, very famous. It was uh, severely suppressed. A lot of people were arrested and uh, had 
a lot of legal problems later on. Um, uh, that's when Putin came back to power in 2012 and became a president again. Um, and uh, I don't think uh, I need to go. Well, you, you, of course, you know, in 2014, uh, the, the story with the Crimea and, uh, uh, and the Eastern Ukraine, uh, Donbass, um, uh, 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 war in, in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so, and uh, I guess you, you, I, I don't want to go in too much details, but that's basically it. Right. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Uh, so um, now, uh, let me just go back up. Sorry, guys. Now Putin, um, well, as Greg mentioned, uh, when, as, as I also mentioned, uh, had joined Sapchak, lost the election, you know. But what's interesting is when he came to Moscow, uh, he moved from Petersburg to Moscow. And I don't know if you guys know, but there's been uh, a clash of two clans. There's a Moscow clan and there's a St. Petersburg clan. So if you started your politics in St. Petersburg, when you make it to Moscow, you bring everybody with you. Um, that's just the way it works. And it's the other way around. Basically, if the Moscow, Moscowites win, they bring everybody with them, right? So in this case, um, you know, uh, you know, Sapchak, you know, famously is from St. Petersburg, brings him in, introduces him, him after he loses the election to Bar uh, Baradin and Chubais. Uh, let me explain. Chubais was, you know, obviously, the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was a minister of uh, finance. Um, and Baradin had an interesting status. I mean, he was actually a president of the KISS, which is the Commonwealth um, republics of that would made up former Soviet Union. So basically a nobody, it was a president of the country that doesn't exist. Uh, but he had a major, major connections. Just to give you an example, who was borrowed in? Uh, his machinations. At one point, the, uh, if anybody knows what Kuranti is, is the clock on top of the uh, um, uh, Kremlin. He actually hired a Switzerland company to fix Kuranti and got a bribe of $15 million. And it was very well publicized. Obviously they had to dismiss him after that, but that's, that's how daring they were getting at the time. So anyway, Putin joined him and they love Putin right away. I mean, you know, what's not to love, you know, he basically, Putin was given an, an, you know, a, a title of an investigator in, into the administration, basically. He was an investigator uh, investigating the people that appointed them. So it just made no sense. So basically they were wanting him to be diligent, but not diligent enough to catch their, um, you know, uh, misgivings or bribes and stuff like that. The biggest uh, knowledge of this area, we know from Putin's wife, actually, Ludmila, because there's really nothing available. Ludmila befriended a German lady um, you know, from 1996, 1998, sent letters in exchange and it, talking about her life. What's interesting, the letters were sent <laughs> from the office of Ilya Triberg. And Ilya Triberg was one of the biggest mobsters of St. Petersburg who literally owned the uh, Kronstadt and the port in St. Petersburg and basically was getting, you know, racketeering people for money. And what is Putin's wife have anything to do with this guy, Leah Tramberg. She's sending all her letters to this lady from her office, from his office. Uh, so, so basically, also what's interesting is Putin had an old uh, friend um, that was part of Stasi. His name is Matthias Varnik. And uh, it's interesting, who is coincidentally, you know, was right now is in charge of Nord Stream Pipeline. If you guys know where it is. That's his old friend from his KGB time. And uh, he calls him a foreign agent. Um, so what's interesting is in those days when Putin was just coming up, Warning was paying a lot of the expenses of Ludmila, which is Putin's wife and her treatment abroad and paying for his vacations. And what does he have anything to do with it? No, apparently Warning right now uh, is actually, um, is part of the board of directors, Rosneft, Transneft, Russia Bank, Rusal, and obviously managing director of a Nord Stream. And on top of it, he became a member of WT, I mean, VTB counselor 
and the Swiss Gas Prom Administration Council. And it's interesting, in 1998, when Putin was on vacation, Warnick, um, you know, paid the whole way through uh, for him to stay in the, you know, uh, in cons. And while he's still, you know, um, kind of tanned, uh, he came in 1998, you know, um, and was appointed as uh, head of FSB. Uh, FSB is the, um, you know, the, obviously they took over for KGB. So that's the, that's the company. So what we're going to talk about next is uh, Putin and his palace. All right. So, um, so what was Putin module, right? I mean, he's become, I mean, Greg already went through a history of Putin. So he's, he's appointed head of FSB in 1998 and famously in 1999, due to the war with, um, you know, uh, Chechnya, which is, he calls a civil war, but really it wasn't a civil war. Uh, he was appointed, you know, with ailing Yeltsin as, um, you know, uh, obviously, I mean, Yeltsin's family, already Yeltsin had passed away by Yeltsin's family to become a president. And what's interesting is, um, you know, his famous line, how he was appointed as president, we have to kill those terrorists inside the toilet. You, you know, it was an interesting line. The terrorist, he, mean, he meant, you know, Jahar Dudayev and independence movement from, you know, Chechnya. Uh, obviously, there was intermixed with a lot of the uh, foreign Osama bin Laden terrorists. But, you know, the major point of the Chechen people want to break out of the Soviet Union. You know, Russia, at that time, Soviet Union, you would say. And then Russia became, you know, obviously, um, you know, uh, uh, a major beneficiary of that. And they just wanted, they don't want anything to do with it. And Jahar Dudayev was a former general who wanted to, um, you know, leave, the grips of Russia. In any in any case, so now Putin becomes a president in year two thousand, uh, and then he be, he continues to this day. You know, the, basically he began and continues to this day the largest operation to seize and extort from Russian state. Each of the Putin's friends get the piece. One sits at the you know uh, and holds the assets of Gazprom. You know, uh, you know we know about Miller. Uh, second one, milking Rosneft. Third one grabs the largest construction project. Basically, this gang of bribes, you know, so he took this whole gang from St. Petersburg, as I was saying, it's almost like a mafia from St. Petersburg, and he moved it from the mayor's office, and he moved them all to, to Moscow, right? Um, so they basically just, you know, uh, despite the fact that you know, these people dressed up and surround themselves with many bodyguards. The founding principle remain on which all is based since dashing day, the St. Petersburg never disappeared. If you want to steal from the budget and, you know, siphon off, you have to share with Putin. So if you work, if you were in St. Petersburg and you work for a mayor's office and you report to Putin, now you're in Putin president's office and you're supposed to be share with Putin everything you made. Okay, and we always, as Greg had mentioned, there was a famous battle with oligarchs. One of them was Hodorovsky, you know, um, and, you know, Hodorovsky, you know, Berezovsky, you know, as we know, Berezovsky had taken his life in London. Uh, but those were the famous, you know, fights with oligarchs saying that, oh, but they're, they're affecting political process. I don't want any, you know, any of this rich people coming in and affecting, you know, uh, the process, you know, political process. But if you think of it, he was just backed by other oligarchs, you know, which will go through this schema. Uh, so how does pal palace look? This is a palace uh, and it's in a city, close to the city of Ganjik, which is Krasnodar Oblast. Krasnodar Oblast is actually, is like a principality of Krasnodar close to Crimea. And it's, it's one of the coveted areas. It's basically this whole land size that he owns is 39 times the Monaco, okay? So Monaco, Principality of Monaco times 39, that's how much of a palace land, including the palace that he has. It includes vineries, it includes hockey rings. I mean, it's crazy what, this is a billion dollar, billion dollar project basically. And there's a thousands of people that are working in this area. But what's interesting is, um, you know, uh, What's interesting is for this one, uh, the, over this palace, there's no fly zone. Obviously, you can't get there by air, by sea. And as Greg had mentioned, 
Um, you know, Navalny has an IT guy, you know, Volkov, you, you said, right? He basically was able to, you know, uh, come as close as he can to look from outside. And then what's interesting is on top of it, in 2006, they had a, a major, major erosion in the building. And therefore, Navalny was able to talk to the, uh, you know, subcontractors that worked in the building and get the inside look of this palace. Uh, this was pretty amazing. And the palace has basically, you can't, if you're arriving by a car, you're basically going through several checkpoints. There's actually border police in there. Um, you know, if you tour the palace, which I'm sure, you know, looking forward to, you'll discover the real palace of Putin. It just, it's not just a house, but also 20,000 20, acres of land, 70, uh, uh, 70 million square meters, almost 740 acres of wineries, 300 acres uh, of, um, uh, I mean, it, it has a chateau, it has wineries, it oyster farms, it has endless luxuries, it has a casino inside the building. I mean, it has an ice rink underneath. It's crazy how huge it is. Um, and then Navalny is asking question where it all came from. How did, how did, how did it all came from? You know, um, and so basically he said the palace is the most sacred and guarded location in Russia without any exaggeration. Um, it's the, it's basically a city within a, is a country within a country. It's impractical fences, its own harbor, its own guards, a church, no fly zone, and even its own, own border checkpoint. Uh, uh, you know, state within the state, Russian state, and, you know, stuff like that. So basically, um, it's near Gelenjik, as I have mentioned, and uh, the total, you know, uh, total area of it, about 190,000 uh, square feet or, you know, stuff like that. So um, what's interesting is six years ago, as I have said, uh, the, pal the palace went through a disaster. Uh, and the disaster name was Mall. Palace was designed with mistakes also. Ventilation didn't work. Roof leaked and it had high, high humidity. Um, they decided to redo everything. So let me tell you, there's this most expensive furniture inside. There is marble. They threw everything out. Billions of dollars were thrown out. And people in Russia, the average salary is $500 a month. And they can't afford food. But here you go. Putin is throwing billions of dollars of worth of food. I'm worth of, you know, uh, things that the Russian people can buy, okay? Since a lot of people were, you know, involved in reconstruction, they, they gladly told Navalny literally about every square meter of this grandiose project. Uh, so what's interesting, uh, within the area, there was two landing fields. Um, so uh, two landing fields, but... Uh, it was interesting, one landing field for the helicopter was removed. And uh, from what he understands is because it was removed, they built the ice rink underneath. It was 56 meters by 26. Uh, and it's a five-story building yeah, underground. Putin apparently likes to play hockey underground and stuff like that. It, you know, it, it, it looks like a modest structure, but it's, it has like five. It has amphitheater inside, uh, you know, not in the palace, but outside which he's not really happy about, and he always rebuilds it. So interesting is, uh, you know, uh, what's interesting is basically, let me just go up, sorry. And then we'll, we'll obviously, um, let's get this funding, all right. All right, so, um, and I apologize, we're not gonna go through a lot of names, but I just want to, what's interesting, back in past in 2005, when Putin took office for a second term, where there was a palace, it was an open field. So remember when I showed you a palace, sorry, let me go back to the palace. There was nothing on it. It was just an open field. There was nothing on it. And a friend of Putin uh, from St. Petersburg, from mayor's office, his name is Vladimir Korshin, which I'll show you on the picture, signs an investment agreement for the construction of a children's sports and recreation camp here with all year round operations. In accordance with the contract, it will be built by both presidential administration and Laris company. And the Laris company, what's interesting is the major shareholder of the company is Nikolai Shalamov. 
uh, 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 Shamalov, if you, you know, it's basically, he was their, you know, their son married Putin's daughter. So it's their future in-laws, uh, so to speak. And uh, also the two other, uh, you know, um, shareholders were former retired colonel from KGB. His name is Dmitry Gorev and business, businessman Sergei Kolesnikov, which we'll talk about it. So what was interesting, Kolesnikov in 2010 published a letter urging President Medvedev. If you remember, Putin was actually elected to two terms. And then in order to, you know, circumvent the system, he basically uh, helped Medvedev become a president and he became vice president. But essentially he was running the country, if you think of it. And what's interesting, Kolesnikov, who was working on this project, and he was one of the businessmen that was part of the LaRousse company that funded this project, exposed um, you know, uh, Putin and said, listen, um, I don't want to be participating in this project anymore. Putin is corrupt. Medvedev helped me. I mean, this guy didn't realize that Medvedev was actually working for Putin. So there was no way he would help him. So what he did is basically he exposed all the offshore accounts that they used. Um, it was unprecedented scale of exposure. Uh, in, and it just went nowhere because obviously Medvedev didn't really care for it. And then you remember Navalny also did the Medvedev piece uh, as Greg had mentioned, exposed him. So we'll just go back to funding areas, sorry. And again, guys, if you have any questions, please ask because you know, it feels like I'm just talking. <laughs> this is not a, this is not a lecture. Anybody has any questions or anything to add? I have two questions. Yes. Zach, okay. Um, the first question is about Chechnya. Um, there was an execution of a Russian um, journalist named, I think, Anna Polikovskaya. Yes. Um, and I'm just asking if that was the, you know, that political assassination of this journalist, if that was part of Putin's plan to stabilize the Chechnyan civil war? Uh, well, it's interesting. It's, you know, there's a couple of journalists that work pro-Putin and against Putin. There's a, uh, there's a journalist, her name is Simonyan. She's actually running right now uh, a Russian one channel. Uh, she's been promoted through the to the ranks, but Politkovsky definitely was an opposing, um, you know, journalist, and therefore he needed to eliminate her. Uh, she, if you he were, actually uh, wanted to expose uh, a lot of uh, corruption and behavior of the uh, uh, Russian soldiers there. I mean, the situation was already stabilized in in Chechnya by that time, but oh. because she she had this uh, a lot of material to expose. Um, uh, uh, Putin's corruption and how he uh, how the deals he made and uh, the uh, certain uh, crimes he covered up. Uh, uh, that that's why she was eliminated. Yes, definitely was a, a, a political okay. move. She was very dangerous to him. Just to give you an example, so the reason Kadyrov right now there was Ramzan Kadyrov and you know it was you know, his his father before. Um, was the elected they were actually former um freedom fighters let's just say freedom fighters you know uh for chechnya right or whatever they call them you know these days you know, yeah they were fighting russian troops they were fighting russian troops and because they uh rebelled against um you know this this the, this this uh terrorist leader his name you know uh doko Ma, you know uh, Umar, if I remember, and then, you know, and Jahar Dudai. Jahar Dudai was actually killed very early in the war, but um, because they rebelled against their main, um, you know, com comrades, Putin had decided to choose the lesser of two evils, and he chose Kadyrov clan as the leader of Chechnya. But if you in essentiality, they killed Russian troops too. So it's, it was, there was absolutely no. And then Kadyrov, the biggest move that he made is like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and forgive all the terrorists that's going to give up on their own and therefore give them uh, an opportunity. Right now, Chechnya is the biggest funded 
Russian uh, area of any areas. And they have the biggest unemployment population anywhere in Russia. You know, the, all of their manufacturing is completely destroyed. Uh, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. And, but they're, the Russia is funding it because they know if they're not gonna fund it, it's gonna turn into a civil war again, so. Ahead, and also right. it's the best trained army right now in, 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 in Chechen. And uh, they, this army uh, used uh, in uh, Libya, in Syria, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 and a lot of um, mercenaries come from that area. They encourage. Um, so, yeah. What's the second question? Sorry. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. My second question is this compound that Putin was building. Um, wouldn't the West have identified that in its surveillance? I mean, um, the nuclear surveillance is bilateral, you know, the Soviets can surveil the US for its nuclear installations and the US can, I think they call it blue sky or something like that. The West can surveil Russia for its, for you know, for nuclear surveillance mm -hmm. as part of this, I think the START Treaty. Right. So wouldn't the West have identified this place but they, how? They, there, there are many palaces. How would they know? Oh, they, okay. They, they, yeah, the nuclear sites have a certain uh, kind of uh, um, uh, structure. They, they have, uh, uh, okay. they could, uh, but palace, why would they, uh, okay. who knows? Yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, sorry, this is in Russian, but I will translate uh, as we go. So uh, how does the, this whole thing get funded, right? Obviously, Putin can just come out and take money from Gazprom and build his own palace. He has to have an elaborate offshore schema with, that was revealed by Kolesnikov. But basically uh, the deal is that, you know, the oligarchs like Abramov, you know, Abramov and Mardashov, I know you obviously know who, you know, Abramov is. He owns uh, FC Chelsea from London, which is a football club. He used to um, be, you know, an oil oligarchs and he sold it out of it. And now he has the most expensive London residence, I think, uh, of all the Londoners. And uh, Mordish, you know, Mordishov, if anybody knows, you can present, I, I don't I know exactly. What happens is in essentiality, uh, there is this company that was set up called Petromad. And what's happening is the Abramovich, Abramovich and Mordishov oligarchs donate money to this company in exchange for medical supplies, you know? And the medical supplies never arrive, but what's interesting, 35% of this donation goes into Putin's offshore accounts, basically. And that's what, that's owned 94% by Putin. So that 35% mostly, you know, let's say 33% is, is, is all an offshore accounts set up for Putin, but he has a covered name called Mikhail Ivanovich, which is not Vladimir Putin, but it, everybody knows who that is. So just basically not to get into the, you know, in face of uh, people, but that's, that's basically how being set up. And this is, this guy is Kolesnikov who was, you know, that's the guy who revealed and exposed, Med, you know, Medvedev and Putin. Um, and, you know, and, and then this is his friend, obviously, and stuff like that, Kojin, uh, Sechin, sorry. All right, let me just go up, sorry. And again, if you have any questions on any of this, or anything to add, uh, let me know. So we'll go into, inside the interior of the palace. All right, so I'm gonna play, uh, uh, you know, about two minute video, if it's okay with you guys. Um, all right, one second. Oops. Sorry. I'm just trying to figure out. Here we go. Why is it not playing? One second. I might have to go out like this. All right, give me a second. Let me stop sharing this and I'll... 
Bear with me a second. Sorry, guys. I thought it would go from Prezi, but oh, here it is. Uh, one second. All right. So bear with me. All right. Let me go back to here, share this. One moment. One second, guys. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the minute of the um, where it is. All right, let me share it now. Full scale. All right, and uh, I'm going to turn off the uh, the sound. Well, you know what? We can have the sound on. It doesn't matter. Oh, here it is. All right. So this is uh, Putin's palace. Um, if you see on top, um, that's actually from Winter Palace. The the uh, um, uh, what is it called? The uh, um, the eagle from the Winter Palace and. Um, and this is inside, so this is his living room uh, of the palace um, going through. Um, all this furniture is interesting, and I'll talk about it, is the company called Polizzi. They only do exclusive um, furniture for, um, uh, you know, it's one-off. They don't really uh, have any distribution. And if you go on there online, you have to order it. Uh, it was custom made. Uh, it's very expensive. One sofa is worth about... A Nineteen to twenty thousand uh, dollars, so to speak, and um, here you see Putin sitting on it and stuff. So, um, and um, this is going further. Uh, this is his, you know, um, fountain area. Uh, going further, this is his bar. He set up for you know receiving. Uh, he, he doesn't really receive the uh, um, the foreign uh, officials, obviously, because he can't expose it. And we'll talk about wineries. Uh, he has his own winery here as well. This is his, uh, you know, movie theater here uh, and a theater as well. So basically he has people performing. It, it's a two floor theater, um, you know, it has, you know, obviously this amazing, you know, decor, um, you know, lodge and, and stuff like that. And what's interesting, famous Russian singers participate and then, he gives them, uh, the Russian singers, the most expensive things he can find. This is Navalny actually talking about it, but um, th this is a Russian singer. His name is Vitlitska. She actually participated um, in, in, uh, in his house and sing singing uh, for Putin. And there's another uh, singer that he gave actually an uh, icon, the relic, Russian relic from uh, 1700s and signed his name to it. That He feels himself like an emperor, a czar. Uh, it's a religious relic. So, and this is the uh, the singer. Um, uh, I forget his name, but um, basically that he gave the relic to. And this is still the decor inside. It's a Putin sitting. Um, you know, this is people performing, uh, and nobody's supposed to talk about it. You know, when they leave, they leave. And now we're going to uh, further areas. Uh, apparently, you know, Putin, um, you know, has the hooker room. It's the best, it's probably one of the best hookah rooms ever seen uh, where he smokes hookah. He likes to discuss his political, you know, aspirations. What's interesting, within a hookah room, he has a, a poll for dancers. I don't know what they do on the, is it a Christmas tree they put on or is a women, you see the poll is pulling up and, and this is from the people that, con, you know, did a construction inside the building and they know in detail. Uh, so they're saying, is it for shawarma? What is the poll for? Obviously, it's for a dancer, go-go dancers, or political reasons. Okay, uh, and then we'll next we'll see.
Putin has his own casino inside where people don't know what he's playing for money or he's playing for um, that this guy Kolesnikov exposes that he has a casino inside that building, whether he's playing for money or he's playing for seats in the Duma, which is their you know, uh, parliament, or the, he's playing for pieces of the Russian you know, companies. And this guy is a Kolesnikov actually exposing Putin. Um, you know, so I'm going to, you know, it will show a casino in a second. Um, and we'll, uh, let me just fast forward for a second. So this is a casino inside his building. Uh, this is very elaborate, crazy elaborate. All right. And he's just mentioning. So I'm just going to, um, go ahead and stop now and uh, reshare my um, um, sorry. All right. All right. Do you guys see my presentation? Back? All right, good. All right, so we talked about funding. Let's uh, let's go further. Sorry. We'll talk about the interior. Um, now, palace, we talked about palace. So um, now we get to the vineyards, all right? All right. Putin has a vineyard, uh, obviously. I'm sorry for this. Let me just move it a little bit up. I don't know why it's not. Putin has a you know vineyard um, also within the area as well. It's actually in the village of uh, Dimnavorska. Why is it important? Because what's happening is um, it was set up you know uh, by a company called Lazuli Berry, um, Lazuli Berry. Uh, but what's interesting is. The wine from this area called Dim Dimnovska is served in Kremlin for, um, um, you know, for different uh, foreign aficionados, like the Chinese president, for example, when he came in, uh, he served him with from wine from Dimnovska, which is in this, you know, in, in this area and has 186 acres of which of 32 are used for the wine and the rest is, you know, used for the, uh, you know, uh, basically having a winery and developing it and stuff like that. So what's interesting is also, he also has another winery within this area called in Krenica. It has actually 13,762 square meters and it's pretty big. And it's also uh, another wine sitting on 520 acres. Uh, and then, uh, so basically he's exposed himself. So he said, I don't own this but his winery from Krivitsa is being served in Kremlin uh, for diff different, different, you know, dig dignitaries, foreign dignitaries. And that's, you know, basically where it is. What's interesting is uh, the, within the winery, there is actually a chateau, which is a building actually, 2,400 2, square meter building where he wants to sit basically and watch uh, wine being made and within this winery, Dimbrovska, there is a, a, a classical music that's played all year, all year round, all day around for the wine, because apparently it makes wine much more tastier, according to, you know, and it, so there's a spa area around the 32 square feet spa area. There is artificial pond in this area. So it's, 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 it's completely uh, on the next level. And what's interesting, it takes about 3 billion rubles, which right now conversion rate is 75. So I don't know, make it, do your math, a year to uphold only wineries alone um, for Putin. So it, it's, it's unbelievable, all right? Anybody has any questions or want to add anything or? I have just one little question. Sure. Um, Putin hosted Xi Jinping and fed him this wine? Correct. Because, you know, Xi Jinping, um, there, um, 
huge symbols of opulence go down really badly in China. You know that Xi Jinping um, refused to play golf with um, Trump because golf courses in China are a symbol of this opulence. So I'm surprised that Xi Jinping, you know, had this wine with him. Well, um, so you, what are you what are you saying that he Xi Jinping wouldn't wouldn't want to drink the wine with him? Because well, I'm surprised that Xi Jinping would engage in this, you know, since you know it goes down badly in China. Well, he doesn't know. What I'm saying is, Nabal okay. is trying to connect. Uh, you know, Putin's palace to um, Putin. Okay, yeah. And since Putin is, uh, have so many offshore companies funding this and his name is not even used, it's some kind of Mikhail Ivanovich is being used. He, okay. Navalny is trying yeah. to say, well, why are you serving a wine to Xi Jinping from the area if you're saying you're not connected to this? Yeah. That's, that's the whole point of this. Um, Anybody else any questions? And, and by the way, this movie, uh, this uh, uh, exposing Putin, it just came out just just a few weeks ago. Yeah. It's when when Navalny came back and was arrested, then the movie came out the very next week. It just it's very recent. Yeah. So the, now, um, go ahead. Um, so I don't know if if you guys want to talk at all about the concept of the power vertical, um, you know, and, and sort of what that means or what people perceive it to mean, because I, I, I've sort of found that when I, when I, when I understood that from a Russian context, it just made things some, it's like a heuristic. It just made things pretty straightforward to understand sort of, uh, uh, the relationship, the interrelationship, and how power can get consolidated, and why it's, you know, let's just say, very challenging um, to sort of dislodge that power, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that that's my whole point, and we'll get to that, but his former wrestling friends, his friends from the mayor's office, he's actually... Stasi friend from KGB time is being promoted and being put into the most important places. So he's building that, you know, uh, pyramid, so to speak, to be he, he, his own class of uh, elite, right? No class class, elite. These yeah. people are not qualified for any of these jobs. They're, oh, they're but no, but 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 they are qualified from the power vertical perspective, right? Like that's the whole point. Like when, once I understood that. It sort of made sense. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it made sense in terms of a power architecture that could scale, right? Right, right. No, I, I mean, you know, it, it's it's a valid point, but you know, he basically just re, you know rewrote Russia. He said, you know what? We can embezzle and seize all the assets. I can put all my you know friends as part of Rosneft, Gazprom. This guy Miller, Lersha Miller. I don't know if you know. He's in charge of Gazprom. Yeah. He writes his own checks. He used to write his checks to Putin when he was a, you know, in mayor's office. Now he's just officially doing it. I mean, and then Miller came back and said, the Gazprom is going to go from, at the time it was a 300 billion company to a trillion company. Guess what? How much Gazprom is worth right now? $80 billion. Yeah. It's been diminished because they've been stealing money like, According to Navalny, I, I don't know. I, I didn't. Well, I mean, the big thing also is, um, and this has been a challenge really for 30 years because it's like a vicious cycle, is that um, the amount of energy, the amount of infrastructure that's needed to invest to modernize the scale that Russia has natural resources is so astronomical, right? I mean, I think the only other country like that is like the United States and you see how hard it is for us to figure out how to invest in any um, infrastructure. Um, and, and so, and we have, you know, 10 times the economy that of, of Russia, but so there's this sort of um, combination of they're not able to make it as productive as possible, right? Like the, like the production possibilities curve, like in economics. And then they obviously, you know, have a, 
a graft program that's probably you know unmatched in human history uh and and so you know you kind of put those two together and there's not really incentives um in the system i, I was listening to this really good podcast about that is that um the concept of sort of import substitution takes over where uh, because there's not an enormous amount of demand mm -hmm. or well there is there's not an enormous amount of availability for foreign goods then you're able to sort of rubleize your economy and then even though the gdp doesn't go up uh you can sort of maintain a let's call it a standard of living that doesn't look like Argentina or doesn't look like other places where, you know, having that sort of um, external product demand, like radically um, challenges your currency, right? Because if people just aren't, if companies aren't spending money to import goods because they're, they're, they're not allowed to, or they're, it's tightly controlled, then everything is sort of produced in sort of a circular economy within Russia or almost everything. And that's been sort of a, let's say, a, a, a feature, right? Not a bug of the Russian, as my friend likes to say, the Russian operating system, ROS, he calls it. And sort of like, that's this sort of closed, you know, iPhone system that you can't kind of get in, you can't play with the hardware, you can't really do anything. You're, you're sort of stuck with its design. Um, and, and that was an issue when, when I sort of understood that. And uh, I think I sent you guys one of those podcasts, um, you know, uh, it, uh, uh, which is uh, the English language of the English language podcast of the Medusa Network, which I think is out of, I don't know if it's Estonia, it's either like they, they all left to go to Estonia or Belarus, um, you know, because they couldn't obviously, you know, broadcast from, 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 from Russia, but. But I think those are sort of interesting drivers when you start to understand why it's it's so difficult or almost impossible to challenge the power vertical within Russia, um, right, right. because they have these sort of um, you know it's like a it's not even a mafia right it's just like they've they've, rede they've redesigned a um, an economic and social and political state. Um, and, and I don't know how you did, I don't know how you just move a piece around. Like, it's almost like my friend makes this point. What if Putin left tomorrow? Does, do we think things really change? I mean, it's, so it becomes that sort of, you know, Gaddafi discussion, right? Like, do we think, oh, we got rid of Gaddafi. Now we get Thomas Jefferson. You know, it's like, that's not probably very likely. Um, well, you're right. I mean, you know, it's uh, no, no doubt about it. So let me just move on and then you know we have a couple more slides and then we can open for discussion and then um you know stuff like that thank you for addition i appreciate it Aaron. um so uh you know navali now trying to prove how this all belongs to putin and you see this elaborate schema it's crazy i mean the winery for dimrovye uh which is right here is being set up by you know, Dimrovia, and which is what is being, you know, uh, you know, fed to or is drank by the foreign dignitaries. Uh, this access is, you know, another winery. Then you have um, uh, another winery that's another company that's doing it. Then you have the uh, company called Binom. That's actually, what's interesting is company Binom uh, is, um, you know, um, uh, funding uh, the palace, but uh, the in essentiality, the whole thing is being given to this guy. Name is Mikhail Lvovich Shalamov, and if you know Putin's mother's name, maiden name was Shalamov, uh, that's his cousin. So all this schema that's happening to to fund all this through oligarchs, through um, you know all of his friends then end up in the uh, company called a in, you know uh, ooo accent which then is given to um his cousin shalama and this guy is really is is a nobody i mean he doesn't he lives in a small house but he owns 39 million you know shares of stocks 
from Gazprom, you know, just because it's his cousin, he gets all this, you know, to keep. So through his cousin, he basically gets to own this. Now, uh, on top of this, um, Sorry, still navigating through Prezi. Um, we have sponsors. Um, and here are these sponsors, right? As I've mentioned, you know, uh, Slash is friends. You know, you have, you know, you have Shvetsov and you have obviously, you know, um, Putin in the middle. But what's interesting, he set up this whole elaborate process of wallet, right? So the way wallet works, Putin funding works is you have all this, um, all of his uh, companies, in, including the Rosneft, uh, moving the, the money through donation purposes. It's basically donations or uh, some kind of givings so the taxes are not going to pay. And then they all go to Putin uh, in, in the sensuality. So that's just how the schema works. And also on top of that, uh, a lot of the people who are involved are his women. And let's just talk about his women for a second. All right. So maybe, maybe nobody knows this, but, um, you know, obviously he's, you know, he's married to Ludmila, but he had a girlfriend. Her name is Svetlana Krivanogich. And, um, you know, and people didn't know why she was so rich. Apparently, she had a daughter in 2013 called Elizabeth from Putin, and she's on the left here. Let me put in the present mode. This is uh, Svetlana Krivanogich. And what's interesting about her, all the, she bought, recently bought a yacht uh, that's about, you know, it's a pretty big yacht, and also owns a lot of the uh, Rosneft and Gazprom stock shares. People don't know who she is. And... Now they found out it was Putin's girlfriend and has a daughter with him, and basically, and he's financing through this company that where he set up a wallet. That's his daughter on the bottom. Her name is Elizabeth Krivanogich. Um, you know, basically, he that's how he buys stuff for her, but she also keeps it for him so that you know it, it's you know it's benefiting his palace. The same with Alina Kabaeva, which is on the right who was the um, gymnast um, that he made, you know, not married, but um, as you know, he divorced his wife and uh, now he has, it's not an open relationship, but apparently he had kids with her and stuff like that. But uh, her grandmother had received a lot of real estate throughout Russia, didn't know what was happening. Again, through the companies that were set up offshore through all these elaborate schemas that also funds his palace, he also, you know, funds his women. That's basically all my presentation, um, and I'm going to stop share if you guys have any questions. I have one question. Go ahead. Um, the video, um, why wasn't that stopped? In other words, China has such a huge firewall that they just stop anything they want. You know, say the abuses in Hong Kong, you know, the Chinese don't see all that. So why was Navalny's video permitted to circulate? And was it shut down? You know what I'm saying? It wasn't shut down. It's on YouTube and uh, you can you know freely watch it. Now they have an English version of it. Um, no, I mean, YouTube is, is an international, you know, he was able to post it. They can't take it down. YouTube has a, you know, okay. like a viral, they can't take it down. It's encrypted. And they, and they said that within one week, there was 100 million viewers. One week, more than 100 million already saw this. But also, Russia doesn't have that kind of firewall that yeah. China has. Uh, in China, you wouldn't be able to uh, uh, bypass that. You know, they, it's not like they would they would shut down. They yeah. wouldn't just be able to bypass and, that. And, and, and also, Russia didn't have it prepared, didn't have it set. They have their own limitations. Yeah. And, I and, mean, and you can't do it on the fly, you know. And, and there's also just nowhere near the scale of the surveillance state that that the PRC. I mean, the PRC is is the greatest surveillance state in human history. I mean, there's there's really not even a close second. I mean, they've they've sort of interlocked every 
component of being a human being, uh, where you live, where you move, where you belong. Basically, you have passports between, think of it as between sort of states, provinces. Uh, there's tracking. Uh, you know, there's there's this sort of scoring process to score you. So you know, there. So so you're almost. Um, it's almost like, I mean, basically, imagine if human beings were credit cards and you put our behavior as the buying you would do on a credit card and how that adjusts your credit score. And then imagine if there was a police force that could adjust behavior around you. So obviously in China, they're, they're not necessarily looking at 1.4 billion people. They're looking at this smaller population that is a, let's say, riskier population to do certain things and then it gets even smaller and smaller so then you know maybe it's only really 10 million people or less that they're really focused on and they have such a large state that they can you know obviously generally speaking pull that off i i don't know how almost any other country on i, I think you, you'd put all of the countries in the world together and you probably couldn't do, pull that off in Russia. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's the scale of this uh, and, and how many, really two decades plus. And, and in some ways, they sort of, they, they kind of added the technology layer to what they were already sort of had in place in China prior, uh, you know, to, to the technology era. So they just sort of amplified it. Whereas I think, to be honest, after, you know, it's especially by the 80s, Right. I mean, Russia had changed or Soviet Union had changed quite a bit when it came to that kind of surveillance, um, except maybe in East Germany or whatever, the Stasi, you know, a few other places. But but, you know, it, it's like they don't have that institutional memory. And so, you know, and I and then to be honest, I also think there's just so many more connections between people in Russia, especially cities and other people in Eastern Central European cities, you know, that that travel is just a lot more dynamic. And I think it's just a lot harder. Uh, and, and also Navalny's team is a very innovative and very absolutely. savvy, computer savvy. It's very hard to- We have really... somebody raised question. Alex, yes. see, go ahead. Yeah, um, I would like to know, uh, I, I was, um, re I'm really interested about the protests that um, happened recently in Russia because of the, Navalny, uh, because of his uh, uh, arrest when he went back to Russia. Um, and uh, I heard that it's uh, one of the biggest uh, locally organized protests. So I really want to know um, what, do you, what do you think, Zach or, or Greg, um, the future, what, what's, what's gonna happen from here on? That's what, that's what I'm interested. I mean, I, we already know the story of Putin and, and Navalny. Yeah. He's very savvy. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's, they say that he's a, he's a guy that Putin is, is the scare of. He escaped death three times and uh, it's almost like he's almost destined to, to take on Putin. But, you know, what's gonna, what do you think is gonna happen from here, Zach and Greg? Right yeah, now, but there's nothing gonna happen. I, I, that's yeah. my prediction because Putin got, 70% 70, 70 of approval, or at least that's what they're saying. In the Navalny video, he's claiming that there's only a hundreds of thousands of people that support Putin, really. The rest are scared. Mm -hmm. and if we really rise up and start going outside and stop right. voting, he's, because he has a Duma in it. I mean, Putin can override. You know what happened in Crimea, right? Mm -hmm. Before he invaded Crimea, he actually went to Duma and he said, I want you to change the constitution for us to invade Crimea, and within a day it happened. I mean, right. it's unprecedented. Uh, and then they invaded Crimea. And, Go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, do you think that this kind of localized protest? Because I don't think I don't think uh, Navalny would be able to mobilize so many people so quickly. Even though I know he's very savvy on the internet, and he's you know he really knows how to how to you know he's used the media for to to further his, uh, his protest against Putin, but this kind of like local ground, um, is it, is it, it you know- a It's not just local, it's not just local. It's yeah. all over the Russia because he right. has a, a, the whole network. There are a lot of volunteers. He, 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 it's lot not, of they're not necessarily his staff, that there are people who volunteer and there are whole organizations that okay. exist all over Russia. He, as a matter of fact, he was planning to run for the president 
he was right. disqualified. So he already had the, those things established and a lot of people very enthusiastic about him and what he so, is doing. So you're saying that he has a lot of backers already. Uh, he has a lot of backers and well, uh -huh. you have to, and also you have to understand that we're talking about that there are like maybe 10, 20,000 people. Uh, yes. That's a huge crowd for, for Russia yeah. that, uh, uh, because uh, the consequences for these people are horrendous. And all of these people coming out, they're all risking their future forever. You right. know, uh, you know yeah. not only if they're, they're going to be arrested uh, uh, and, and all kinds of brutalities may happen during the arrest. I can guarantee you anything right. can happen. Beating, rapes, everything so, is happening so, there. So do you think, you know, is, is it going to, it's, you know, every revolution is going to take, you know, blood. And no, no. He, he, do you he, think uh, that Putin is, it's existential for him. He, he has a lot of power, very powerful apparatus uh, of suppression. Uh, he is mm -hmm. not going to let this happen. Uh, uh, it, it's going to be, in my, in my, in my prediction, it, he will eventually suppress this. They will go underground. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, this will not uh, disappear uh, like nothing. Uh, uh, very often, it, uh, these are the seeds to something else in the future because but but, but a lot of people will, will will be forced underground so uh, there is no you, question they have no chance yeah. really they so have you no think chance. navalny now that he's in prison do you think the chance of him being executed or you know no, um, well there is a chance but the, I, I think yeah. he would be afraid to do this uh, first uh -huh. of all we know about that he doesn't want to make a martyr out of him but, but also mm. now there is so much attention on him. He's been in the West uh, that right. uh, it, it would be such a horrendous uh, uh, affront to the, uh, to the West that the consequences could be severe. So right. he, yes. will, he will probably, uh, he already got almost like three, two and a half years there. Uh, he could actually keep him there indefinitely, indefinitely because he will probably do all kinds of violations in prisons. Uh, he will probably uh, be humiliated by uh, criminals in there. Uh, the, he'll go through all kinds of uh, hell and he could keep them there indefinitely. Um, and it's so, much harder yeah. to, uh, well, yeah, I, I, I right. think it's, it's a threat. There is a new generation. There is a, a, a lot has been already spilled. It's not gonna disappear. But, and, and it's going to create a lot of problems for Putin, but it's an existential threat. He has no, uh, he passed the point of return. He, he, he cannot let this uh, overwhelm him. He is going to mm -hmm. suppress it and he has I, all the tools for it. Right. So would you say that so far, because I, I, I'm, I don't know too much about the Russian history with Putin, but you know, from this lecture, I learned a lot. But do you think that Navalny definitely right now is like the biggest threat to Putin's? Uh, um you know yes uh, yeah he is he is the Definitely. he actually has been amplified because of this poisoning and and this exposure right. the, right. in the whole world he, uh, uh, because the novichok because we already had in 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 britain um uh, 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 some poisonings and uh, uh, all of this connected his 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 statue has been so amplified right now he is right. definitely the biggest threat and number one I, uh, I was uh, looking at some of the, yes, I was looking at some of the Navalty uh, videos. You know, I, I I watched the way he talk, and I you know, and he how he expresses, you know, thoughts even from the 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 that uh, hearing, the, the last hearing in January. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel like he's a very charismatic person. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. It's not just, and he he really is. Um, really want to speak for, for, for the Russian people. And, and I, I know that Russian people, very, very different from Chinese people. Russians are deep down, you guys are fighters. I, that one's for sure. Chinese people are not so courageous. I think Russian people are definitely, definitely. Um, so I think, I think um, even if Navalny is taken down into prison, I think there will be a next one, and uh, the Putin is going to have to fight all these waves of, of, uh, of you know, quote unquote threat. Yeah, he, his his yeah. chief of staff Leonid Volkov is is in in Great Britain right now, so he is actually organizing 
uh, he's uh -huh. actually providing the, the network and support, uh, uh, all kind of administrative and, and uh, IT support. So Navalny can actually, uh, you know, uh, can, can do a lot through him uh, because his network is sti still in, in existence. So, but the only th thing that's going to be suppressed is going to be more on the ground and, and it, they're going to continue and who knows what's, what's going to happen in the future. But definitely, I don't see the straight way for the Navalny to get out from the prison anytime soon. And, uh, and for this movement to explode, like, uh, let's say, in Ukraine, I, I don't think it's going to happen at all. No chance, in my opinion. Right. right. But, but Putin, yeah. to put off this, to suppress these waves of, of, you know, this new waves of protests, you know, to his regime now, you know, do you think he's going to be he's going to be brutal and head on with the protesters? Yes, even the more. Not now. Yeah. There's no return. Oh. Now, now he goes. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if he will move like closer to the Stalinist time. <laughs> you know, yeah. well, like um, what happened to Hong Kong? Uh, well, much worse. Much worse. Yeah. They, the, yeah, it is uh, now. It's so well, we don't uh, know what's it, really happening. You know that maybe it is. It is as bad as it sounds in Hong Kong. We only know what they show us. Oh, Hong, Hong Kong seems pretty bad. I mean, that's yeah, just pretty bad. Know. Hong Kong is finished. Yeah, it's done. I mean, it's. Exactly. I th I think we the same a, thing will be with yeah, this moment a, for now. There's a Dave is asking a question, and we'll let everybody participate. Uh, David Wayne said, "I apologize. My sound is not good. Uh, my sound is not good." So I will speak a question or two. Can you talk a bit about Navalny connection with the far right? All right. I met, you know, well, apparently you met us, you and me on the, uh, the Russian reading for uh, Prigozhin when we did one. And he said, the second question, what is the level of popularity of Navalny? Uh, he was uh, roundly defeated by uh, Putin candidate in Moscow mayor's race. How many people can he actually mobilize? Finally, what are the, his policy plans beyond exposing corruption? Um, Greg? Well, that first of all, that's one of his weak spots because he doesn't have a policy. He didn't express specific policy. And that, you know, we don't even know, like suppose he would, he would be like a leader right now. We don't know what he would do. We do know that he, he is a Russian nationalist I mean, he really uh, looking out for uh, for Russian interests, uh, um, but uh, uh, I I I don't I don't think he uh, he has a, a, any defined um, um, you know policies with regards to the mayor. First of all, that was a number of years ago, and he uh, definitely became way more popular. But even uh, when he was uh, running against uh, uh, Sabianin, who was Putin's uh, nominee. Uh, uh, he basically was second uh, uh, in, in Moscow and he managed to get 27%. And we know that the Russian elections is really rigged. So I think he got much more than 27%. And, uh, uh, and now I, I wouldn't, if now he would run in Moscow because obviously uh, Moscow is a center of everything in Russia. Uh, I mean, people, in Moscow, uh, everybody trying to live in Moscow. Uh, there are probably like 20 million people living right now. There are a lot of uh, people who are not counted. It's almost like an immigration uh, uh, because uh, uh, the salaries in Moscow is twice as big as uh, uh, the rest of the countries. There are so many opportunities. Everybody who can get there uh, are trying to get. Of course, it's more expensive. Um, uh, so in Moscow, uh, he got a lot of support because that's where the most uh, progressive people, uh, people who uh, are more educated, they're all trying to get into the Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, but Moscow is definitely uh, much more advantageous. Uh, I, I would, if he would run fair election right now, I would, I, I would think in Moscow he would win, you know, definitely. But there is no fair election in Russia. You know, there is no way. It's uh, not going to happen. Yeah, so and, I, yeah, and there's this other dimension there, which I think a lot of people don't realize, is that um, Putin reorganized all the regions, and uh, you know, and, and there used to be, I think, 93, right? Uh, so some number like that, 96, 93, I, I forgot, but um, and now I think it's 36. 
And then also the old role of a mayor uh, has been replaced in a lot of places with a city manager, basically. And, you know, which is a very different animal. Um, I mean, just like you have in the West, a city manager is just different than elected mayors. And so I think, you know, this sort of um, tentacles or the, or the diffusion of, of this uh, approach, this power vertical approach is so entrenched um, that I, I don't know how you, you know, change that really without having kind of complete chaos. Um, and, and it's something I've, I've sort of learned to sort of understand is that that is what there is a sort of philosophy of, which is to create resilience in the governing model, uh, not equity, not liberty, not freedom, not, you know, all these other things, uh, but, but the resilience in it and be able to withstand any outside shocks. Um, and, you know, from the people I've read, this guy, um, Alexander Dugan, uh, who's, you know, like a big- Yeah, star. he's very conservative and he is very religious. Yes. Uh, you know, he is, yeah, uh, he, definitely. He's sort of like a, you know, if, if, I mean, there's almost no parallel, right? It, it's, it's, you know, he's a, he, he, he represents a type of sort of neo, almost like neo-Russian um, exceptionalism, right? That might be like- Na Nationalism, maybe. Yeah, like, well, exceptional yeah. nationalism. Yeah, right, right, right. Exceptionalism and nationalism together. Um, yeah, that, that we're, we're the best, the Russians are the best. Yeah, yeah and, and, and then also because of that, these are our sort of anchored beliefs and this is our geography and this is how we should- Yeah, end. yeah pa patriotism, patriotism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's almost- Patriot. You know, there was a concept of Pax Britannica, Pax Americana. It's almost right. like Pax, Pax uh, Russo, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, he's very famous. Um, but yeah. So anyway, I sorry. Think, I think I think if right, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, Navalny will never be allowed to to run. I mean, he has a lot of open cases against him. He has a lot of judgments. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if he, in a fair election he would win I I the, uh, the Russian presidency, but uh, but I but I but I think he could win Moscow, uh, may, uh, you know, mayor. But uh, so, but he, his popularity growing, but uh, it will be suppressed. Um, uh, uh, this movement uh, um, because uh, Putin will stop at nothing to suppress it. There is no. Way and and he has a very a lot of loyalty. I mean, you remember uh, one of the um, reason uh, one of the reasons why Ukraine uh, collapsed and 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 the president of Ukraine um, uh, what, what's his name I forgot uh, ran is because his security uh, uh, forces uh, started to doubt. They started to disintegrate, uh, and and he started to w was afraid that some of them would turn against him. There is no chance of this happening with Putin. I mean, he has a, a very loyal layer of military and and uh, FSB protection. Uh, you know, he is safe. He is definitely, um, uh, and he has no scruples. He he will go to any end to to suppress this, and he will. Right. It's, it's I, I mean, correct. to me, one of the interesting things is going to be how does he calibrate for Putin and the, the regime uh, economic development that doesn't impact that power vertical, right? Like how, how does he sort yeah. of un, un, like, it's almost like let a little bit of steam out and let a little bit of sort of, you know, new oxygen in, how, how does he kind of calibrate that? Because obviously to be honest, I mean, uh, you know, and I think this is something we don't ever talk about is, you know, uh, capturing Crimea was really about, it was really like, like a Dugan military strategy issue, right? Where basically the Russians probably grossly underestimated the Western response, but at the same time, they did not want to have a NATO uh, naval bases you know, uh, uh, on the Black Sea, period. But do you really, but do you really think that that was the NATO's ambition? No, I don't, but it doesn't. Well, it, that's, it's, it's a propaganda. That's it, the whole it thing. Is, but it's also a, um, it's a hinging strategy to that propaganda that 
that that that that that messaging is continuous, right? And so to have to to have to um, explain that, right? To have to explain a Ukraine and NATO, and and sort of yeah. well, I, if, if, if people don't understand that that Crimea uh, has uh, a, a lot of nationalistic uh, absolutely. value, absolutely. Because, you know, it's it's been in in it, it's really considered to be Russian land. It's been in in Russian hands since the end of the 18th century. Uh, they, uh, they spilled a lot of blood to get it. They spilled a lot of blood to defend it. You remember the Crimean War? The, there was uh, what they saw, uh, what they say, heroic defense of Sevastopol during the Crimean War, during the World War II. I mean, there was, uh, uh, Crimea is, is very uh, known. It's also an area where everybody usually goes for uh, vacation because there, there aren't too much uh, of a, uh, it's almost a, like a uh, Hawaii. It's almost uh, like a Hawaii. Right, right. So uh, uh, almost everybody question. probably been there. I huh? we have another and, uh, question. Yeah. Uh, actually, Dave said we didn't address the connection between Navalny and the far right. Is there any connection? Far right. I, I am unaware of it. Actually, yeah. Uh, but, I'm, I'm I mean, definitely there could be some connection because. He is a, a nationalist, yeah. and, and I know that they asked him a question. He 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 was against uh, taking Crimea like that, uh, but uh, but but he said, "Would you give it back?" He he basically said no, <laughs> because now it's out. So I mean, he's uh, but he definitely criticized Putin's um, uh, hand in in the East Ukraine. You know that that was a, a a big problem because he he didn't think they should have gotten involved but in he's that. Trying to, he's trying to make Donbas sort of a mini Vietnam, Afghanistan kind of. Why did we do this? It's a waste of life. We already had crime. right. I mean, right. he is. He, look, I would say one thing: Navalny had seemed to learn that other um, people who you know have tried to sort of compete against Putin haven't learned is that you know it was very easy to label them anti sort of russian nationalistic and saying all you are is pro european pro eu pro american blah 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 and then they they just become sort of someone of the elites by him trying to you know constantly flank you know the the, the kremlin on sort of the, let's say the the catherine the great borders of russia right to say strong russia and then really focus his energy on you know, we've put ourselves in Russia in this position through incompetence, bad, bad governance, corruption, you know, just, just, just not trading enough, blah, blah, blah. It's actually a smart strategy because he's sort of separating the two because then you can sort of focus on attacking Putin, which I, I do believe there is more runway in more people saying, you know, the, the, the mismanagement in the economy is so massive and then not having to sort of deal with, oh, turn Russia into a NATO kind of tributary state, right? Like, which I think many other earlier reformers got sucked into being labeled that way. And if he's really hard about Russian power and Russian nationalism, it's much harder to label him that way. I mean, it just becomes yeah, really- No, no he, he, is, he is doing- I'm he is, people, hold on a second, guys. Let's let's let other people ask questions, and then sure. we can add more. We have about like we'll go a little spill over. Like, let's do ten minutes, and then you know, uh, let yep. everybody go on our Sunday. <laughs> I have a question. I have a question. Um, Novichok failed with the Skripals. They both survived with no apparent neurological damage. So. And say Nemtsov, that assassination was very successful. Um, it was you know, shot. It was, I'm he sorry? Was he it was, was shot. He was shot. They never yeah. identified who ordered right. the no, what killing. Happened is, yeah, what happened is um, they said the cameras <laughs> lost track of the cars that were escaping. They, uh, so basically, they, yeah, there, there was a track that kind of covered the cameras, and some cameras didn't work. Yep. And and they eventually identified that there was some Chechens, but then uh, the, they tried to investigate and never came to anything. So it was obviously, you know, um, uh, 
uh, sabotage the, the investigation. So it ne never, never came up to this. And, uh, you know, Novichok, uh, I guess they're, they're just lucky to survive, you know, but I'm sure that, um, uh, uh, you know, they could have been successful because they immediately saw their prominent people. But I mean, it, aren't these drive-by shootings a lot easier to do than, than the Novichok, which people seem to be surviving? Well, it's, Novichok is much harder to investigate yeah. than, uh, you oh. know, who did it, when, that got done this. They could be like, the, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of things that could be caught accidentally. There are people with a lot of phones, yeah. you know, who knows? Well, and there's one thing in Russia, I have a good friend of mine, because of, of car accidents and insurance, everybody has these little like GoPros on their car, like everybody, like all my friends, they, they just that's just what they do. And so capturing video just becomes a lot easier, okay. um, you know, and in, in, in I think especially yeah. you know, I mean, here, you, there is no even question. There's no even like no, no loose ends. I mean, there are no ends. Nobody, there is nobody who, who do you investigate? I mean, who did this? I mean, they, they just deny it was a Novichok. And, well, and you it. need a state power to investigate right. this. Right? Yeah. You need someone with the labs, the modern sort of infrastructure. Yeah. And Russia knows that the moment one of those countries, Germany, US, France, UK, maybe top seven countries, eight countries max, well, Russia can throw the, you know, crazy kind of get shorty mentality. And then everyone says, okay, okay, okay. You know, let's go back, you know, we don't want to get you crazy again. And so there's just this sort of accordion effect going on over and over again. Um, I do think it was an escalation to do this on German soil. It was really a test of Merkel. And, um, you know, you guys give me a second. Let me just uh, share the uh, schedule for this week and then you can continue talking. I apologize. Sorry. So um, we have uh, this Wednesday, we actually have Rommel uh, discussions. If you know, he was a German general. And uh, then uh, Aaron uh, is going to present Hanseatic League on this Sunday. And Thursday, we have an exciting one. We actually have a history of, um, you know, uh, ancient um, weaponry, bone, arrow, and armor, presented by Sergio. And he does a lot of reenactment. So it's going to be, you know, a, a person is going to be dressed up in uh, armor and uh, using bone, arrow, and stuff like that. So not to fight, but just to demonstrate. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And that's for next week. Um, go ahead, sorry, Aaron, apologies. No, I mean, I, I just think that you have this very, um, that, that Russia play or tries and sometimes succeeds at playing this sort of chess where they're always sort of uh, calibrating their actions towards these small figures and the big thing they've done is by, by eliminating basically uh, political parties, right? You just can't get this sort of momentum across the country uh, in a movement. It gets a lot harder. Um, and, and I think then you're just sort of playing whack-a-mole with these one-off sort of leaders that just come up every few years. And Russia has enough of a state apparatus and kind of a playbook at this point to sort of deal with them. And I think the only risk is where does the escalation end, right? I mean, there was a assassination attempt in the US like about seven years ago. Um, you know, there, it, so it's like, do they get so clumsy that, you know, it's sort of like you just, you know, it's just, it just everywhere, right? Like you can't deny it. You know, it's, it hits the global news you know, ecology we have now where it just shoots around the world in 24 hours on every platform, everything. And they have sort of egg on their face. And, and I think they've done a pretty good job at preventing themselves from getting into that position. But, you know, I think one of the hardest things you have with Russia is they have a lot of what I would call free agents almost, right? They have a lot of people who are sort of competing with each other to do what they think the intentions are. And some of those people, you know, go off the rails and do things that, you know, weren't authorized or weren't sort of defined as priorities. And then Moscow has to kind of kick into crisis mode 
and sort of dig out of whatever that hole was. And I think that's that to me is sort of the background risk that constantly goes on is is those sort of free agents running around. Uh, you know, in the, you know, in the West, basically, is sort of where the majority of their threat of those people are. Um, thank, thank you. I appreciate it, Aaron. And anybody else, any questions? If not, we'll, you know, close out for a day. Uh, you know, thank everybody. Thank you for joining today. I know this was a short one, but this kind of came last minute. Sorry, I did my research like last couple of days. Uh, uh, you know, next time we'll be more prepared. But Greg did an amazing job. Appreciate it. Great job, Greg. Great yeah. Job. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, and then, <laughs> Rolf, how are you? <laughs> Good morning. Um, and, and so, any questions? Anybody have any questions? No, right? Okay. We'll close out. And then uh, see everybody next week for Rommel Weaponry and Hanseatic League. Uh, should be all interesting one. And I, I put a bunch of links in here for different articles that I think some of you might like. Just explain. I'll put it on the uh, in the YouTube channel. Okay. We have a YouTube channel there. Thank you so much. And have a Thank good you. nap, Ralph, before the game. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> See you guys. Enjoy the game. <laughs>